I'm going to kick off, as, as Beth just alluded, by just trying to explain some of the, the basics, some of the fundamentals of the, the banking system and the monetary system. Because I think, um, well, a lot of you in the audience aren't from NGOs, but a lot of you are, and I think it's very important for campaigning organisations to really understand this stuff. And it's, it's really important that you understand it and can talk about it in a way that policymakers, um, economists, um, and other people who you know, have influence on this stuff will take seriously. And one of the main reasons for that is that economists themselves don't properly understand what I'm going to talk about and disagree amongst each other about these, these issues. Um, so it's really important if we're trying to change the system that we can engage, you know, not, not in great detail um, and not, not, not necessarily getting into the technicalities, but at least having a basic framework upon which we can, we can make arguments. Um, so how do I... Uh, yeah. So, I mean, that's the reason that we decided at the New Economics Foundation, which, by the way, is a London-based uh, think tank, um, which essentially works to promote alternative economic policy in the, in the areas of social justice, well-being, and ecological sustainability, and I work in the, the finance team there. We decided to, to publish this book, write this, this book, not so much to promote a specific alternative to the current system, of which you'll be hearing a lot of later today, but just to lay out a sort of basic set of ground rules about how the system actually works. Because without that basic understanding, it's very hard to, to build an argument for change. And, and the area of, of monetary reform, as, as some of you are probably all too keenly aware, is one where a lot of people come up with sort of big bang solutions and say, if we, if we just did this, everything would be sorted out. You know, um, there, there, are, there, are, there are easy wins. I don't think there are easy wins, actually. And I think the first stage in this um, struggle uh, is to ensure we have stronger public understanding of, of the basic facts. And we wrote this book with, with Richard Werner, myself and Tony, who you heard from last night, <coughs> and, and Andrew Jackson, who's now working with Positive Money, and Positive Money gave us a lot of support. And we also had support from the Bank of England, actually, um, this uh, pristine, esteemed institution in the middle there. Um, we had somebody, a mole from the bank, who, uh, who supported us, reviewed the entire book, um, didn't want his name published on it, but, um, but we, had that, uh, we had that input from the bank. And Charles Goodhart, who's you know, probably in the top, top sort of five monetary economists in the, in the UK, uh, kindly wrote a forward. So it's got that kind of stamp of authority, hopefully, and credibility uh, to it. So I'm just going to touch on a few sort of fairly minor questions uh, in the next uh, 15 minutes or so. Uh, which are these, uh, what is money, what do banks actually do, as opposed to what, what the public sort of, uh, uh, and some economists think they do, um, who decides how much money goes into the economy and where it's allocated, uh, uh, and that's, um, that's what I'll try and do in, in uh, the next 15 minutes. I wanted to start with just some reflections on the nature of, of money itself, um, because this is an area that is, that is also very poorly understood, I mean, separate from the, the sort of banking issue, but the two tie together in an important way. Um, those of you that have studied economics will probably have come across the idea that money has different functions. Um, typically, th those, those two that, that come out are uh, a medium of exchange, a way of um, exchanging things with each other, and a store of value, a way of holding on to um, future purchasing power. Um, there is another function which is less well known, which is unit of account. Now, the uh, sort of orthodox classical and then neoclassical economic schools of thought have concentrated very much on this medium of exchange function uh, and neglected the, the other two functions significantly. And there's an important kind of history here, a story um, about the nature of money that, that sort of comes out uh, and justifies uh, orthodox economic thinking in this area, which is essentially that money emerged naturally over a course of time to enable us to move beyond barter exchange, to get beyond the, the need for what I have 
and what you have to be exactly the right things um, beyond the double coincidence of once. It's quite an inefficient um, way. You know, you're hanging around for the, for the right good, that I'll give you this good if, if you have exactly what I want. Um, and <coughs> certain kinds of commodities, typically those that are highly portable, that have intrinsic value, um, emerge naturally and are used, ra rather than being commodities in themselves, they're used as exchange commodities to enable us to exchange things. Um, and that's the sort of classic story about the emergence of money. And of course the, the implication of that is that money is itself <coughs> is largely a sort of neutral commodity that, that lies over the real economy, which is, which is about exchange, which is about labour, which is about land. And the class classical economists um, promoted this idea very strongly. Uh, money is simply the oil that wields everything else in the, in the economy. In fact, history shows us, and, uh, and economic anthropologists, historians, uh, and heterodox economists, actually, have done a lot of research to show that, actually, many thousands of years before the invention of coins and, and gold and these commodities that are sort of optimised for the uses of, of medium of exchange, there were actually um, accounting. Accounting was taking place. Records of debt and credit were taking place. Um, and this is a cruciform block here, the top left, um, from the Babyl Babylonian times. So 4,000 years ago, thousands of years bef before gold coins, um, people were making records, deposits with interest uh, of credit and debt. And the point I want to make here is to say, if money is essentially a relationship of credit and debt, um, then money is also socially and politically constructed because you have debtors and you have creditors. Okay? It's not this neutral commodity. Um, and the, the people who determine what money actually is are those people who determine the unit of account that is used to keep those records of credit and debt. And historically, we've seen that the organisation that tends to do this is the most powerful organisation, whether it's you know, the chief of tribes, whether it's palaces, and, and more recently, the state essentially has determined what that unit of account that we keep those records of credit and debt in actually is. The reason we use sterling rather than any other piece of paper um, is essentially because we can make our most routine payments with it, which are taxes. Okay, that's, why, that's the main reason there is demand for this sort of unit of account over any other kind of, of unit of account. So the point there is that the state plays an absolutely fundamental role in determining the, the moneyness of um, any particular item. And, and what I'm trying to explain with this slide really is that the, the medium through which we transact with each other uh, changes through time from these cruciform blocks thousands of years ago through to coins, through to IOU, paper notes essentially, through to modern money uh, in the form of credit cards um, and, and essentially digital money. It changes over time. But the, the, the relationship between the creditor and the debtor uh, remains, and that unit of account remains the same. So the commodity theory of money um, is much less significant in that sense. What we've seen over the last uh, 30, 40 years is essentially what Richard was talking about yesterday, the privatisation of the money supply uh, by virtue of a number of different factors. And you know, it's not some big conspiracy this, it's the conflation of developments in electronic technology and deregulation of the banking system. So the red line shows essentially public money, you might call it notes and coins plus central bank reserves <coughs> created by the, the Bank of England, sort of public money. And you can see that up to um, the, the late 60s, uh, the, the amount of commercially uh, bank-created money in notes and coins was, was quite similar. And then since then, um, commercial bank money has kind of exploded exponentially away um, to the point where 97% of money is now essentially created uh, by banks. Um, so we've had this move away from uh, what we, a lot of us think of as, as money, notes and coins, uh, towards this digital private bank money. 
Now, that brings us to the question of what banks actually do and how they, they create money. And Richard talked about these yesterday, but I just want to go into it in a bit more detail because it's really important to, um, to understand it. The popular conception of banks, which kind of comes out of this commodity theory of, of money that I was talking about, is that they essentially take money from people who need it less for transactions and want to use it more as a store of value. Typically old people, perhaps. Um, some old people, some lucky old people. And they uh, recycle it into the economy. And they're essentially intermediaries, and they recycle it to those people who, who need it in the short term for transactions. Small businesses need working capital. They can't easily get capital from, from other sources, as we heard yesterday from Adam Posen. Um, and that's banks' function. They, they essentially just intermediate. Um, this, this explanation uh, is, is really inaccurate um, in today's monetary system. As we heard yesterday, banks actually create money. They create credit. Um, and when they do this, they create deposits. And it is that those deposits are our medium of exchange. We use those deposits for payment. Um, now, this is, this is a slightly difficult thing to get your head around, so I'm just going to spend a little bit of time on it. Those of you that are not accountants <coughs> may not be familiar with double entry bookkeeping. It's very important to understand this, um, this process. When a bank, a bank has a balance sheet, it has assets, which is essentially um, what borrowers owe to the bank, plus the bank's own, own money. And this includes loans. In fact, it's mainly loans. But on the other side of the balance sheet, banks have liabilities, which is what banks owe to us, to people. And when a bank makes a loan, a loan in this case of £10,000 to Robert, it creates an asset. It creates something that um, Robert owes to the bank. But at the same time, it also creates a liability because that loan is also a deposit, a liability of the bank to Robert. And that is the magic of double entry bookkeeping. Now what you have to understand about this is that no one else has had any purchasing power taken away from them. This is simply, this is credit. It's the creation of credit um, and at the same time the, the creation of money because those deposits on the liability side can be used to pay your taxes basically. So the bank's created an IOU that you can use to pay your taxes. All right? And as we heard yesterday, the, the, you know, the, the state has essentially franchised away that power to these private banks. So have a little think about that um, and, and, and what it means. Um, that £10,000 is, is, is essentially money. Now, what I want to talk about is <coughs> the constraint upon this sort of magical money power creating uh, ability that the banks have or lack of. You've probably heard, hopefully, that the central bank has an important role in the economy. Um, and there is these things called reserves at the Bank of England, which we seem to play an important role. Well, how exactly does this work? Well, when banks make transfers, when they, when they create loans and, and make transfers, Actually, they, 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 they exist within a, a system called the intrabank clearing market where they, they, they transfer those payments at the level of the central bank. Each bank has a, an account with the Bank of England where it has reserves. And, and when a payment is made between Richard and Stuart, actually what really happens is a payment is made from um, HSB's reserve account with the Bank of England, in this case, to Barclays' reserve account. Okay. So you might think, well, actually, the, the private bank has to hold £500 of central bank reserves in order to make this, this payment. I'm going to have to speed up a little bit. Um, but in reality, within this uh, market, within this uh, intrabank market, there are, although there's 50 banks altogether, there are only a few really big banks that dominate most of those payments. They're listed here. You'll probably be familiar with them, the big six. Um, and most of these payments... Oh, uh, most of these payments come back at the end of, of the day. So there's a loan goes out here, but it gets paid back to another bank. So actually banks only need to hold a very small fraction of these reserves at any one time. 
There is a popular explanation, which you know, there's an on, and there's an ongoing raging debate within the, um, the economics profession about this. Amazingly, um, that, that the Bank of England can control the amount of credit and money that's created by banks uh, by having a reserve ratio, saying that banks can only lend a certain amount, you know, 10% reserve ratio, which, which implies this kind of model of, of credit creation, where you have a certain level of base money along the bottom, and if it's a 10% reserve ratio, banks have to hold 10% um, reserves for every additional loan that comes in. This model assumes that there's a sort of mathematically limited amount of credit that can be created, because over time, the money runs out, and essentially, um, the banks are no longer able to lend. But this model empirically no longer applies. Um, what actually happens is banks create credit, they expand their balance sheets in the way I, I've just explained. And the central bank really has no choice but to ensure there is enough reserves within the banking system, within the, the intrabank market, to ensure all of those payments go through. Now they, ha they, they try and control these reserves with, with interest rates. But you know, the, the important thing to remember, the bottom line here, is if the bank held back reserves from the banking system, the system would collapse, the payment system would collapse, you wouldn't be able to get money out of the machine, there wouldn't be enough liquidity in the system. So the point I'm trying to make here essentially is, you know, it's the tail wagging the dog. The banks make decisions about how much credit to create and the, the central bank is forced to respond to accommodate this amount, this volume of lending. And essentially banks' decisions are driven more by their own confidence in the economy than by any, any other key issue. I mean, they have to ensure they have enough cash as well as reserves because we take cash out of machines. But other than that, other than the need to have enough cash and enough reserves to ensure those payments reconcile at the end of the day, there's, there's no real constraints in our modern banking system. So I want to sort of finish on the allocation point, because this is also very important. There, there, there is a sort of ongoing debate in, in economics about whether you know, money is endogenous, i.e. it's driven by the demand for money by firms. Of course, it is driven to some extent by this. But it's always the case that as a borrower, you know much more about whether or not you're going to be able to pay back that loan and what's going on in your business than the bank does. Okay? And so the banks have a, an incentive to, to ration the credit they give out and to choose those borrowers that, are, that they perceive to be less risky or that are going to make more money, essentially, that the loan is going to, going to create more money. And this is very important to understand because you know, this is about the incentives the banks face. So if a bank has a choice between a business and the business owner has limited liability versus lending to somebody who's got a, you know, for a mortgage, the bank knows if that loan fails, they can take the house. They're going to go for the, for the mortgage under, under the current kinds of arrangements. Um, and this results in this rather problematic outcome in the UK. This chart shows um, uh, the, the net bank, bank net lending by sector since 1997. Um, and what you can see here essentially is, is that only a tiny amount um, around sort of 8 to 10% of bank lending has gone into uh, business, has gone into real GDP related activity as, as Richard was alluding to yesterday and it's becoming a smaller and smaller percentage over time. So when it says business lending there, that includes construction, it includes small business lending, it includes transport. You know, the things that actually create jobs that you know, enhance growth that is non-inflationary. And most of the rest of that stuff uh, secured lending to individuals, essentially mortgages, um, financial inter intermediation, you see this massive growth um, around the financial crisis. This is just speculative, non-productive finance that inflates asset prices that causes these, these booms and busts. This is a dysfunctional financial system you are looking at here. It is not working for society, for the economy. It is a highly inefficient allocation of capital going on here which is causing this problem. And I quite agree with, with some of the comments we heard yesterday. Let's control this. Let's restrict the kinds of credit we don't want and let's incentivize other forms of credit. This is really, it's not, it's not a complicated issue and we can talk about capital 
reserves and other forms of regulation until the cows come home. But you know, this is, this is the bottom line. This is what's happening in our economy. It's totally unsustainable in every sense of the word. Um, and I'll finish there. Thanks very much. Thanks, Josh. Um, we've got five minutes for questions before Ben Dyson is up. We need to find a balance point here. New money currently comes from banks uh, that, that making loans. Why can't all new money come as base money from the Bank of England and is spent into the economy to provide services, to reduce taxes, to get rid of VAT, and uh, that thereby uh, that we can uh, have base money that, uh, in the economy instead of bank-created money? Easy. <laughs> um, um, the bond market is lef left out of your graph. Um, many large companies, I think, are now not going to banks because they find them too expensive and are raising funds directly from the bond market, which would raise that bottom bit of business lending very, very substantially on your graph if you were to take it into account, I think. Uh, Doug Thompson, um, I wonder if it would be worth just spending a few seconds, if you could, on the comparable examples perhaps in Europe or in the US where there are a large number of small banks which are an important part of the financial system, particularly at the SME level. And is that something that if we were to reconsider the structure of banking in the UK would be a useful thing for us to explore? Thank you. Okay, good questions, yeah. Um, I'll just start with that last point, actually. I mean... I think that there's going to be a full session on, on local banking later today. But um, absolutely, I mean, essentially what we have in the UK is we have this, this sort of quasi-oligopoly, essentially, of these, these big banks. Uh, and as Richard was saying, um, they're, they're essentially competing on the same, you know, big, big profit kinds of loans, uh, speculative types of loans. If you have smaller banks, they can build up relationships with business over, over time, and they're in, they've got much bigger incentives to carry on lending, even with that limited liability issue. So that's absolutely one of the solutions that we should look at and will be discussed in detail later today. With, with regard to the, the bond market, yes, you're right. A lot of uh, larger companies and medium-sized companies are able to access money through the, the capital markets, and this is a very important uh, development. Um, but essentially, for, for you know, small businesses, actually, SMEs, that, are, that you know, are the real drivers of the economy. They're creating more jobs, a higher percentage of people working in smaller businesses. That's where innovation is going to come from in our economy. Um, and we, w the economy is not going to work if the only businesses that can, can, can get finance are these larger ones. We're going we're to you know, have a sort of increasingly sort of oligopolistic kind of capitalism. So it's vitally important that small businesses can get access uh, to capital um, and the final, the first point, um, which I think what you're proposing is, is sort of positive money for reserve banking uh, approach where all money is, is publicly created. NEF has supported uh, this, this scheme. We, we think it makes, it makes sense. One of the ways I like to talk about it is, is about separating the payment system and separating the sort of medium exchange function of money from the store of value function. It, if you think about, I don't know how many of you are familiar with Zopa, which is peer-to-peer lending agency, which is totally outside this, this banking system. You make loans, uh, sorry, you, you, you invest money. It's, it's directly lent out to people who need it. Zopa is a pure intermediary in the way that we, we, a lot of people think banks really work. You get a better rate of interest, but you don't get the taxpayer guarantee. You combine that with PayPal and use all your money you need for transactions is in, is in PayPal. It's 100% safe. There's no risk attached to it. There's no need for the financial services compensation scheme. And there you have a very safe um, and, and I would have thought more efficient um, system of, of organising um, the, the supply and creation of money. So yeah, we, we support that scheme very much. It's a scheme that, you know, in, in some senses is more radical than, 
than, than perhaps um, we, we, we can get through in the short term, but, but absolutely in the longer term we're interested.